All right, the title of this morning's message is Do Not Be Unequally Yoked. Do not be unequally yoked. Uh, what does that mean? Well, first, let's start with what is a yoke. A yoke is basically a wooden cross piece that is fastened over the, the necks of two animals and then attached to a plow or uh, a cart that they would pull. So if you think of two oxen being joined together, their necks would be locked together in this yoke. So that means they would have to walk in the same direction. The yoke causes them to walk side by side, at which point I am reminded of what the scripture says in Amos chapter three, verse three. It says, can two walk together unless they are in agreement? So, when a believer becomes yoked together with an unbeliever, what happens? Uh, the believer starts going where the unbeliever goes. The believer starts agreeing with what the unbeliever says. They start acting in a way that the unbeliever acts. And what does the Lord say in verse 17 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Come out from among them and be separate saith the Lord. So we're going to break this message down into three parts. Uh, being unequally yoked, we're going to look at how this may be done. Then we will look at why this should not be done. And of course, this has implications not only for uh, what we're talking about here in, in church, but it has implications for marriage, for business partnerships, and even to a degree, even for friendships. But let's start with the immediate context, which is religious fellowship. Paul begins in verse 11. He says, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, in return for the same, I speak as to children you also be open. So what's Paul talking about here? And we've discussed how the apostle had such great love for the church that he founded. Paul views them, he views the Corinthians. See, when he says, I speak to you as children, that's not an insult. He's saying, you're like my children. Uh, you're like my spiritual children in the faith. He's saying, my heart is open to you. Open up to me, open up to us and what we are trying to say. And I think it's important to remember how this letter of 2 Corinthians begins. In chapter 1, Paul talks about me and Timothy, Paul and Timothy, writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints, right? With all the saints. Why is that significant? Well, what is a saint? Right, uh, The world has done a lot to confuse uh, what a saint is, but a saint basically, it's a synonym for a Christian. A Christian is a saint, a saint is a Christian. So the saints are the Christians in Corinth. And the idea of what a saint is, it does speak to a, a purity of heart, that's true. But a saint is one who is set apart. Okay, that's the, that's the primary meaning there. A saint is one who is set apart. They are different. They are what? Separate. They are separate. So Paul and Timothy, they open up that way in chapter 1. And now once again, they are pleading with the church, be open. Listen to us. We love you. We're not telling you this to beat up on you or to put you down. We love you. Please listen to what we have to say and what does Paul say? Verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial, which is just another name for Satan? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now turn to Exodus chapter 20. 
Exodus chapter 20. And do you remember what the Lord said about himself uh, when he was talking to Moses, when he gave the Ten Commandments? He says to Moses, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You hear the word jealous or jealousy usually has a negative connotation to it. Well, it can't be negative across the board because what does God say about himself? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And he says that within the context of idolatry. And of course, Paul tells the Corinthians, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? Look at Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5. The Lord speaking, he says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am what? Jealous. A jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations, and don't miss this part, of those who hate me. Of those who hate me. One thing uh, the Lord does not appreciate, to say the least, is divided loyalty among his people. And again, just that word jealousy, it brings all sorts of things to mind. Usually it'll bring uh, a relationship between a man and a woman, right? So jealousy can be in relationships, marriages, when a spouse or a significant other is flirtatious towards members of the opposite sex, or God forbid there is infidelity, that provokes what? Jealousy. jealousy. And the act of infidelity is a hateful act, as opposed to faithfulness, which is a display of love. So we're going to see in a moment in the Ten Commandments, it's not just a list of thou shalt not, or something that condemns. God is teaching about what love is in the commandments. So what's the point here? Spiritually speaking, when God sees his people being unfaithful, having associations with idolatry and false religion, that makes God jealous. We just read that. All right, now turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. See, we had to establish that because if I just said, you know, God is a jealous God, few people might not believe me. Well, I don't think God is like that. Well, we just read it in the scripture. So what are Paul and Timothy calling for in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? They are calling for religious separation. Okay, that's a message that needs to be preached in more churches today. Religious separation. Now what do we see? We see an antichrist agenda of bringing everybody together. And it sounds good, bringing people together. Paul's calling for religious separation. See, it goes against the grain of what the world is saying, does it not? Yeah. Verse 17, therefore, and... Therefore, okay, why is that there? Paul's saying, based on everything I just said, do not be unequally yoked. And Paul here is going to quote from the Old Testament scriptures. So we see that this is a principle that most certainly still applies. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22. So going back to the Ten Commandments and thinking about the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments not only show us what sin is, the Ten Commandments show us something about love as well. That's not usually what people think of when they think of the Ten Commandments, but it most certainly shows us something about love. The Ten Commandments tell us how to show our love for God. 
right? We, we say, have faith in God, love God. You know, oh, how do I do that? How do I have love for God? How do I show my love for God? See, we love God when we worship God. When we refuse to bow down and serve idols, showing our faithfulness to the Lord, that's how we show our love for him. When we keep his name holy and we do not use his name in vain, that's how we show our love for God, to keep a day set aside for him, to keep it holy. See, if somebody says, well, I love God, but I don't gather to worship God, I use his name in vain, I ignore all of the commandments given, on what basis can they really claim to love the Lord? Likewise, if you say you love your neighbor, I love my neighbor. Now it's true, I lie to him and I steal from him and I commit adultery with his spouse and I want to kill him, but I love him. Nobody would buy that. It is the same for God. Do you remember how Jesus summarized the Ten Commandments? Matthew 22, look at verse 35. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is this? This is a summary of the law. The summary of the Ten Commandments. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. It's a summary of the commandments. So the first half, if you think about it, the first half of the Ten Commandments deal with man's relationship to God. Have no other gods before me. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath holy. So the first half of the commandments deal with man's relationship to God. The second half of the commandments deal with man's relationships with his fellow man. So to show your love for God, and neighbor is not to have a warm, fuzzy feeling about them. Now, you might have that too, and that's okay. But that's not really how you show your love for neighbor. You show your love for God and show your love for neighbor by doing them no harm. Whether it's outward in the flesh or even if it's inward in your heart. So with all of that said, it is clear that Paul was seeing something, maybe many things, in the Corinthian church that were not honoring to God and that were probably not helpful to their relationships either. In his previous letter, you remember how Paul talked about those who were eating meat sacrificed to idols. And in this letter, Paul is expressing his concerns about church members who are giving an ear to the doctrine of the false teachers. And all of this amounts to doing what? The Christians in Corinth, they were flirting with the world. They were flirting with the world. They were indulging in the flesh, and thereby they were giving a foothold to Satan. You know what happens when Christians flirt with the world? God gets upset. God gets jealous. Now, in our church, speaking of this whole idea of uh, separation and religious separation, we actually have a, a, a statement on this in our church constitution, in our doctrinal statement. I'd like to read it. We touched on this a few weeks ago. In the doctrine of the week, here's what the Morris Corner Church Constitution says. We believe that all the saved should live in such a manner as to not bring reproach upon their Savior and Lord. And that separation from all religious apostasy, all worldly and sinful pleasures, practices, and associations is commanded by God. 
Now, I had mentioned before that the primary context, because we want to know what Paul is saying and why. So the primary context of 2 Corinthians 6 is that of religious fellowship. So the Christians in Corinth were getting a little too close, a little too cozy with the pagan temple. If I can use this illustration. Let's say there is a member of Morris Corner Church who is here on Sunday morning worshiping the Lord. And then on Monday morning, they're up at the Peace Pagoda in town, meditating and taking part in their activities. Would you see a problem with that? Some churches would say, that's great. Let's, let's join together with them and do this. That's exactly the type of thing that Paul is talking about. So in Corinth, there were some connections and associations that needed to be severed. Okay, so now that that, the primary context has been established, let's get into some of the, the questions about being unequally yoked, how this may be done. Well, generally, there are about four ways, usually when this is discussed, about four ways that this happens. Again, religious fellowship, that's number one, and then marriage, and then business partnerships, and then even friendships. So once we look at those, then we'll move to our final point, which is why these things should not be done. Okay, so number one, religious fellowship, because that's mainly what he's talking about. We should expand upon this. We just saw how the apostle warned the Corinthians against fellowship with idolaters. Many of them were former idolaters, but they came out of that and placed their faith in in Christ, but some of them, maybe it was family members, there were still some connections. There were still some associations that Paul doesn't explain, but they were inappropriate. So let's, let's look at this and how this might even happen today. Uh, for those of you who are older, uh, you may remember this, how it uh, wasn't that long ago, really, if you think about it. It was unheard of. It was unheard of for Protestants and Catholics to have any sort of religious fellowship. Who remembers those days? Okay, so many of you. My, how things have changed. <laughs> things have really changed. This start and say, well, why did these things change? And don't, don't get upset with me. This is a fact. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm just giving you what happened. The, these things started to change in the middle of the 20th century in large part because of the Second Vatican Council. That's on the Catholic side. And on the Protestant side, the ministry of Billy Graham. Those two movements helped to bridge the gap. Before that, Protestants viewed Catholics as idolaters, with their churches being filled with graven images that they would bow down to. And Catholics viewed Protestants and Baptists in such a way they viewed them, they viewed us as schismatics, heretics. We were of the devil. That's what they would have said. Now listen, I think it's there's something to be said about how things have changed and that some of the bitterness and the divisive rhetoric has improved. I think that's good. I think it's good that we can talk to each other and get along and that neighbors can get along. That, that's a good thing, I believe. But on the other hand, we've seen what has come as the result of this, which is the setting aside of truth. We live in a, what's called a postmodern culture that no one believes that truth is even a thing anymore. And that's painfully obvious. So we're talking about religious fellowship. Here's another word. How many of you have heard of uh, ecumenism or ecumenicalism? Let me see your hand. Okay, so just about the same number. Well, ecumenicalism started... It started in a, in a good way, I think. Maybe good intentions, Lord knows. But it started with Protestants working together with other Protestants. I mean, we, we get together, uh, I get together with a group of people from other denominations and we get together and pray and I do that, I feel comfortable with that because they're saved. <laughs> they have the same gospel. 
But ecumenicalism began with Protestants working together with other Protestants. And then it quickly moved to Protestants working together with Catholics. And then it jumped now to what is called the interfaith movement. Basically, all religions getting together as one. Uh, we've seen this uh, with the uh, joint uh, prayer services or the prayer breakfast, right? You've all heard of this, right? The prayer breakfast where you have the Jewish rabbi, the Catholic priest, and the Muslim imam. It sort of sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. You know, a Catholic <laughs> priest and a rabbi and an imam all walk into a bar. <laughs> But they get together and they have this joint service and they're all praying. Who are they praying to? Yeah. You ask each and every one of them, they're going to give you a different answer. You know, don't tell me they're all praying to the same deity. We saw a prime example of this from uh, the Congress a few weeks ago when a United Methodist Protestant minister prayed in the name of the monotheistic God. And he says, he is called by many names. And you know, that's true. God is monotheistic. And God is called by many names. That is true. But then he referenced a Hindu deity with, who had multiple heads. You know. And you know, the strange thing about that is Hinduism is not monotheistic. Hindus are polytheists. They believe in many gods. So it doesn't even make sense. So considering all of that, what would the Apostle Paul say? If he, if he saw some of these things going on, what would Paul say? What would he say to any blood-bought, redeemed saint? What would he say? He would say, do not be unequally yoked. Listen, let, let all the religions of the world join hands and come together. Let them do it. Just don't you do it. Amen. Amen. Here's something that we should all be able to agree on. A Christian is to be yoked with Christ. A Christian is to be yoked together with Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 11 verses 29 and 30. Jesus himself says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the first point, do not be unequally yoked in regard to religious fellowship. The second point we're going to look at is that of marriage. Uh, from what I can tell, usually when people talk about do not be unequally yoked, usually they're referring to marriage. That's been what I've noticed. And what are they saying? A Christian is not to marry an unbeliever. It's that simple. All right, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians 7. And certainly we could go back to the Old Testament and see what is said. How the Israelites were told not to marry any foreign wives. And that really had nothing to do with ethnicity. It was that the foreign wives, the foreigners, worshipped foreign gods. That was, that was more of the issue. Uh, just one quick example from the book of Genesis. Those who come on Wednesday will remember when we covered this. Uh, Isaac and Rebekah, when their son Esau married uh, foreign wives who believed in other gods, they were so grieved over it. And Rebekah, now her son Jacob, she was really concerned that he might make the same mistake. Genesis 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. Those were the foreign wives or the foreign women. If Jacob, listen to this, if Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? If my son marries one of these women that are just like all the other women of the land, my life will be over. That's pretty intense. That's how she felt. So you can see the serious nature of this. Obviously, not everybody takes it that seriously. Rebecca did. And now look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39. A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she is at liberty 
to marry uh, to whomever she wishes. And then what does it say? Only in the Lord. So she can marry whoever she wants as long as they're a believer. So, in other words, Christians may only marry other Christians. And you notice I use the word may, right? It's like when, when your child says, you know, mom or dad, can I do this? And you're like, well, I'm sure you can. But the question is, may you do it? And that always drives them crazy when I do that. But I use the word may. Christians may only marry other Christians. I did not use the word can because obviously Christians can do it and Christians do do it. And again, this isn't a matter of you know, beating up on somebody or trying to make somebody feel guilty. It's, it's for those going forward. Don't make that mistake. To marry an unbeliever is to be unequally yoked. And again, this is, it, it, you say, well, it's too late. I already did that. Well, nothing you can do then. Matter of fact, Paul says, do not divorce them. If you're married to an unbeliever, do not divorce them. Love them, and, and hopefully you'll lead them to Christ. Amen. But Paul is trying to prevent others from making the same mistake. It is not God's will, certainly not his perfect will, for that to happen. Let's just say, well, why? Why? Let's just consider a few things. This is very practical. If a Christian marries a Jew, are you going to bring up the children going to church or to synagogue? How do you make that decision? Are you going to celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah? How do you make that decision? Usually one is going to get their way over the other and that can bring resentment and all of the rest. So do not be unequally yoked. Also, if a Christian marries an unbeliever, you're going to have two different worldviews, two different sets of morality. One, if something comes up, the child wants to do this, go here. One parent's going to say, we can't, no, that's not okay. And the other, why not? And there's going to be this butting of heads. So do not be unequally yoked. Yes, this is a commandment. But you know what? It's just really good advice, too. <laughs> and God gives his people, these do's and don'ts, not just to do it, because he wants what's best Amen. for his children. He wants to spare his children the pain and the difficulty. Just as any good parent might have these rules and tell their children, you shouldn't do this and I don't want you doing that, and to the child it feels like they just want to spoil all your fun. But a good parent does that because they love their child. A parent who doesn't care and does not teach their children these things, that's a parent acts like they don't care. And our Heavenly Father is a Father who cares. Amen. Amen? So we've looked at this principle in terms of religious fellowship. That's point number one. In terms of marriage, that's point number two. And now the third point in terms of friendships. Okay, now... To be clear, nobody is saying that you shouldn't be friendly. Nor are we even saying that it's wrong to have an unbeliever that you consider a friend. I mean, friendships are not even necessarily a yoking together, so I think this is different than the previous two. But I think we get that if somebody is truly our friend, we should be able to be open with them and, and to be honest with them. If you can appreciate someone, even though they don't have faith in Christ, they should be able to respect and appreciate you in your beliefs. So there has to be a mutual understanding. And we need to be wise. Proverbs 12, verse 26. You can make a note of this. Proverbs 12, verse 26. The righteous, he's talking about believers, the righteous should choose his friend's carefully. So we've looked at religious fellowship, we've looked at marriage, friendships, and now business partnerships. Uh, certainly being in business, if you are in business with someone, there's going to be some sort of legal, uh, legal partnership. But even if you're just working with someone, working alongside of someone, you say, well, that's not a yoking together. Well, you know, the workplace can bring people very close together, very close together. 
Oftentimes you'll have the same outlook. If you're gonna make it work, you need to have the same approach, the same goals. Being in business, uh, your lives run basically in the same channels. Uh, your actions usually largely agree. And if, if you have this totally different approach, a believer and an unbeliever, and you just have all these differences, it's gonna lead to issues and, and quarrels and, and perhaps even bankruptcy or worse. How often a child of God has lived to rue the day when he or she entered into a business partnership with an unbeliever. Now going back to that verse from Amos chapter 3 verse 3. How can two walk together unless they are in agreement? That's a rhetorical question. You know, you know the answer, right? Okay, so we've looked at the context of 2 Corinthians 6, and we've looked at how people can be unequally yoked, how this can be done, how it plays out. So now before we close, let's briefly look at why these things should not be done. First off, from a common sense point of view, you just look at it, it's, it's not a fit. It's like oil and water. It's like joining together, if I can put it this way, it's like joining together heaven and hell. That's not possible. I understand that. You understand that. Hypothetically, if you join heaven with hell, heaven would no longer be heaven. It would just be corrupted. That's usually the way these things work. Look again, 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? See, believers follow Jesus. Unbelievers follow the ways of this world which are constantly changing. You know, a Christian usually believes the same thing he or she did 10 years ago, 20 years ago. With an unbeliever, I mean, one year, five years, things can radically change. Jesus said that believers are the light of the world. Unbelievers tend to love the unfruitful works of darkness. How can you have both light and darkness? You can't. So first off, it's just not a fit. Second, we should consider the pitfalls. How many have found this out after it was just too late? The disunity, the pain, the loss of peace, the entanglements. And at this point, I think we need to be fair. I think we need to acknowledge that just because a Christian goes into business with another Christian, or just because a Christian marries another Christian, that is no guarantee either, is it? So we have to acknowledge that. But you know, if someone yokes together with an unbeliever, someone you know is an unbeliever, the problems are just that much more likely. And this leads us to the next reason as to why a believer should not be unequally yoked. It's expressly forbidden by God. If those, listen, if those reasons weren't enough, God says no. Well, that should be enough, right? We see a very similar statement in Revelation 18 where it speaks of Babylon. Uh, Babylon is usually defined as the corrupt world system. Revelation 18 verse 4, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. What does that result in? You receive of her plagues. So the doctrine of separation is a very clear command in Scripture. Not a very popular uh, command, but it's very clear. So you might say, well, how does all this apply to me? In conclusion, how does this apply to me? You know, the whole business thing, that doesn't really apply. The, the, the marriage thing, that's not in play for me. The friendship part will always be a balancing act. Certainly. And listen, I can almost guarantee, I can almost guarantee you, we will be pressured to compromise regarding religious fellowship. Yeah. If you're a believer and you have a testimony, a public testimony, there will be pressure for you to compromise on that. 
So just to reiterate, God doesn't just give commands for the sake of giving commands. God is a God of order, God is a God of reason, and God is a God of love. If the Lord tells his people not to do something, he has a purpose. And we can rest assured that the Lord's purpose is a good purpose. The Creator knows what is best for His creation. So let's close with these verses, 17 and 18. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. That's a negative command, a prohibition that is followed by a wonderful promise. Do not touch what is unclean. That's true. What does He say next? And I will receive you and I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Let's close in prayer. Father, how thankful we are for your mercy, for your guidance. We know that you tell us these things because you love us. So help us to remember these truths and give us the wisdom to apply them in day-to-day -day life. And Lord, also, we don't want to be so separated as some are, where we only talk and interact with those who are just like us. We are in the world, but we are not to be of the world. And just as Christ reached out to and showed kindness to all, Lord, help us to do the same. And Lord, I pray if anyone listening has never given their life to you, trusting in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the remission of sins, I pray that they would put their trust in you now as you would give them eternal life. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.